everyone, and welcome to the NOAA rounds for this upcoming academic year. It's uh, number eight, and this is the first session of the year. So my name is Brian Chan. I'm one of the senior health economists at IHE and also the secretariat manager for NOAA, and I'll be facilitating today's session. So it's my pleasure to introduce the presenters for today, Dr. Deborah Marshall and Dr. Tony Takima Cruz. Excellent. Okay, so <laughs> I'll start off with a bio from Dr. Marshall. Uh, so Dr. Marshall is a, a professor and uh, Sphere Chair in Health Economics Value and Impact at the Cumming School of Medicine and is also the lead for value impact and knowledge mobilization for the One Child Every Child Canada First Research Excellence Fund program at the University of Calgary. Her applied research program assesses the value and impact of health services using health economics, social economic benefits, patient preference research for both national and international programs in precision health and patient-oriented research, particularly in musculoskeletal conditions, inflammatory diseases, child health, and rare diseases. She su supports the Embedded Research Fellows as the nominated principal applicant for the uh, CIHR Health Systems Impact Fellowship National Cohort Training Program um, and set out to advance the capacity for sustainable and patient-centered learning health systems across Canada. She's also the founding co-investigator for the Patient and Community Engagement Research or PACER program at uh, University of Calgary, which trains people to uh, design and conduct health research using specific adapted methods of qualitative inquiry. Dr. Tony Tagima Cruz is a research analyst for uh, Dr. Marshall's Health Economics and Health Services Research Team, holds a bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering, master's degree in information technology and management engineering from the St. Louis University in the Philippines, and a doctoral degree in operation management from the uh, School of Business at the University of Calgary. Her research focuses on applied stochastic operations uh, research tools in healthcare for decision making. Her previous research uh, included applications of queuing theory and discrete event simulation in offloading physician services to support health professionals in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis analysis of the Edmonton General Surgery referrals. Her current research is on the cost effectiveness of uh, I guess what we're going to be talking about today, position of exome sequencing in uh, the diagnostic pathway of patients suspected of rare genetic diseases. So our talk today is entitled uh, Exome Sequencing in the Diagnostic Pathway of Suspected Rare Genetic Diseases. Does the order of testing affect its cost effectiveness? And we're going to hear quite a lot about that. But if, uh, before we start, a few housekeeping details. So participants will be muted throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A function. And I believe the chat is also open as well. I will be monitoring that. And both Tony and Deborah are OK with questions during their presentation. So feel free to uh, put questions that you may have, and I will read it out to them. Um, and also there'll be a designated Q&A period after the talk as well. There's approximately 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to hand it over to the speakers for their presentation today. Thank you, Brian. I'll just share my screen. Wrong. Great. Yeah, well, while Tony's putting that up, um, I'm starting. So I'll just say hello and thank you for joining today. Um, and I recognize some of your names from uh, HSEG, uh, gosh, a couple of weeks ago now, I guess. So it's really nice to see you join and um, thanks for your interest in this. And as Brian said, very happy to sort of chat as we go along. Um, it's always, uh, I don't know, interesting when, you, when you're doing presentations and you think about the uh, time frame of, you know, developing the concept, preparing the grant, 
getting the grant, <laughs> executing the grant, and uh, now uh, being able to report and um, analyze and look at the results uh, from the work. And uh, so we're happy to share this with you. Um, some things on the slides, and I'll be providing various color commentary along the way as well, um, as I am want to do. So yeah, please feel free to jump in uh, as long as we're not really tight for time. So I'm Deborah Marshall, as you have gathered, and I think you're seeing, yeah, got the whole big slide there now. So thanks for that nice long introduction, uh, Brian. Um, but uh, lots of acronyms, I realize, in those uh, words. Um, but uh, hopefully that gives people a sense of, of our background. So next slide. So um, just as background, um, I don't know how many of you work in, in rare diseases or rare genetic diseases, but um, one of the things you'll see quite often, uh, whether that's in the lay press or in the scientific literature, is that these patients, um, and therefore also their families, of course, uh, with rare genetic diseases, often experience what we call this diagnostic odyssey. Um, and it's often very long. Um, and I'm talking really long sometimes, you know, we've seen data and talking with families, whereas sometimes, you know, five years um, with a few even longer. Um, and part of this um, journey, uh, which they'd rather not, not be on, I can assure you, um, involves a lot of different tests. Um, and it might not even be the typical tests that you would expect, you know, doing genetic testing or something, but a whole series of all kinds of um, tests ranging from imaging to pathology um, and as well as blood and laboratory type tests. So this image, um, which Tony does, Tony is excellent at uh, creating these wonderful visual slides. So many thanks to her, but this tries to reflect um, this journey uh, broken down in a way that that differentiates what we're going to call indicator tests, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and non-indicator tests. Because there's some tests that are really specific and specifically done to try to reach a diagnosis, and then there's a whole lot of other things, and we'll be showing you this. And this study uh, really has been able to uncover this um, in a lot of detail uh, that other um, studies have not to date. So that's the uniqueness of what we're doing here. Next. So in terms of these diagnostic tests, I alluded to it briefly, but there's, you know, kind of the standard genetic tests. So chromosomal, chromosomal microarray is very commonly done, and often as a first um, test. And then there's a whole range of single gene tests and then also gene panels, as well as cytogenetic and molecular tests. And then in particular, and this uh, title and this presentation in this work um, is around exome sequencing. So this, this is shown and known to uh, have a higher diagnostic yield for rare genetic disorders compared to what we've kind of waved our hands and called standard genetic tests. And the idea behind all this was, you know, could we reduce the time to diagnosis? Um, but naturally, and maybe because this is a health economic seminar, of course, there's more cost um, with exome sequencing than standard genetic tests. So this, this is the question, um, and this is the protocol we published, along with my colleagues uh, from Sick Children's Hospital, um, as sort of describing uh, our whole study and I'll show you in the next slide, I think gives us a little bit more information. So I had mentioned this idea of having indicator tests and non-indicator tests. So, so one of the things that actually took us a fair bit of time um, was trying to figure out how we were going to capture all of the data we had, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and sort of describe it and organize it for lack of a better word, you know, how do you manage this data? And I will tell you, this is a lot of data and Tony can, can describe the pains of working with that even in more detail um, because this is not being trivial. But if we take it at a very high level, what we've done is, is broken this into what we've called indicator tests. And we made up this term, 
and non-indicator tests. But the indicator ones specifically contribute toward achieving a clinically valid molecular diagnosis of a rare disease. And when I say we made this up, we made this up with our team of medical geneticists, clinicians. Uh, we, uh, the health economists, didn't make it up ourselves. Um, so we, we, we actually spent a lot of time with our clinical team to figure this out and also to actually go through and essentially um, create the patterns for what are indicator tests in the thinking of a medical geneticist and what would be included as something they explicitly ordered to get at this diagnosis. And then we had all the rest. So we called these non-indicator tests. So we kind of created this in a in a big way at a top level in a binary fashion to say these are kind of more the routine workup when we're talking about non-indicator tests. And then underneath this, you'll see under the indicator tests, um, we have non-exome sequencing um, tests, which include those ones I mentioned to you, the, the chromosome microarray, the gene panel, the single gene. And there's also this list of other. So that includes the biochemistry, electrical imaging, and pathology tests are the main categories. And underneath that, there is a whole list of individual tests in each of those categories. So this entire categorization um, scheme honestly took about a year and a half to work through with our geneticists based on our data and what we observed um, from the diagnostic pathways of our patients. So at the top, you'll see there's over 400 test types captured by these indicator and non-indicator tests in our cohort. There might be others, but it's a pretty big cohort. And then in addition to that, we have exome sequencing. You see on the left-hand side, there is a red box. So that gives you the, the sort of framing of how we approach this. Next slide. So our question then, the next bit, yeah, is, you know, where in the testing pathway would we include exome sequencing? Knowing that it's more expensive, um, is it better to do it later? So do as many tests as you can, try to figure it out, or is it better to do it earlier? Um, but then the balance question there is, well, um, it's expensive. And, you know, when we started this um, and prices are changing all the time, uh, but it could be three, four thousand dollars, sometimes five thousand dollars for an exome sequencing. So it's not trivial. Um, the other thing to know is that these tests until recently were all sent out of province. Um, in fact, many of them went to either Finland or the United States to get testing. So it's not a trivial thing to do um, in terms of cost or time. So this is the question that we were addressing in our study. Next question is, where do we do this? And then so our objective specifically is around what about the time to diagnosis um, for patients with rare genetic disorders? That's what RGD is. We all love our acronyms, don't we? Um, and um, and uh, also look at the costs and effectiveness of exome sequencing testing at these different points in the pathway as observed in our cohort, and that's the next slide. Um, and our data source is a study which is called Care for Rare. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, but it's a rare disease study um, that was initiated, gosh, over a decade ago. And then we had a subsequent grant um, called Care for Rare Solve, um, which is written there. SOLVE doesn't actually stand for anything. It's not an acronym. It's just SOLVE. We want to solve um, the rare diseases and identify people with rare diseases. So this was part of the um, Genome Canada CIHR call for applications. Gosh, six years ago now, uh, I had the privilege of being on the defense team. Um, for those of you who haven't been involved in those grants, they have multiple stages. And the final stage, when you're in the final running on the short list, is you get to go in person and sit as a panel 
it was a moment of trauma in my life, I have to tell you. Um, in front of a panel, um, only, only five people, well, four people um, can be invited from your research team. And you have an international panel of experts grilling you um, along with CHR, all the funding agencies and various others, assorted dignitaries watching and taking notes, but they're not allowed to say anything. So it's quite quite the process um, from uh, a few years ago, and they continue to do it this way. But we were su happily successful, um, and we were allowed to proceed with this research. So. Um, the work that we're presenting today is on a subset of this group. It's three, about 300 patients, 305 to be precise, that got included in this analysis um, because cleaning these data took a very long time. Um, we now have the final cohort, which is a 719 patients, which is large. In fact, it's huge in rare disease world. Um, it comprises... Um, cases from eight uh, medical genetic centers, um, prim well, only in Alberta and Ontario. So we partnered in co-principal investigators uh, for this study uh, in Alberta and Ontario. So with Genome um, Canada, with Genome Alberta, and Genome Ontario, all as partners in this work. So all of these were um, 18 years or younger um, at the time when uh, exome sequencing was reported, um, and their first indicator test was after 2002. And that has to do with the um, administrative data linkages and being able to get the testing costs uh, related to this. We do have data prior to that date, but that's why the cohort's a bit smaller than originally. So really important to note here is that the SOLVE cohort is essentially defined as patients where there was a baseline clinical genetics evaluation that was done. The genetic etiology for the phenotype was suspected and they're eligible for exome sequencing based on clinical guidelines. So these are the Canadian Association of Medical Genetics guidelines. And this would have been between 2019 and 2022. So that's how this cohort is defined. And it's good, really important to know that because they are unsolved cases of, of suspected um, genetics. And then really importantly, our study used not only the data from the cohort that um, were eligible, but we did retrospective chart reviews of, of the whole diagnostic process of these patients who got exome sequencing as part of their diagnostic odyssey all the way back to their birth, okay? So some of these records are extremely long and literally have thousands of tests um, in them. And Tony does have lots of backup, interesting graphs with long tails where you can see how many tests uh, were done on, on these cases. But a lot of data, a lot of data cleaning and a lot of data management to get the data even ready for analysis. So. Happy to say we're here, and this is our results so far. The manuscripts are under review and um, for the results of this. And I think Tony was going to uh, take it over from here. So thank you, Tony. Okay, thank you, Deborah. And um, yeah, and thank you, Brian, by the way. So uh, Deborah talked about the data that we have. And yes, yeah, so, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears came into the cleaning of that data. <laughs> Tony is persistent, though. She's still standing and smiling, so that's good. He is. Happy yes. to survive that. And so um, just a quick note about our data. So all of the patients in our data are patients who, ha uh, who had WES. Okay, so that is the, uh, that is the uh, characteristic of the patients that we have. All of them had WES. Some of them had anywhere from uh, one indicator test to, I don't know, um, 14 or more indicator tests before they got the exome sequencing. So that is kind of data that we have. But to answer our question, uh, there are some questions that cannot be um, easily answered by the data. So we needed to model that. So we used discrete event simulation to model that 
such that we can also um, see patients having uh, other tests in between that uh, from their first time they got a test to their exome sequencing test and then they would have a certain diagnosis from other, in, uh, other indicator tests. So uh, let me backtrack a bit. As I was talking about them, as I said, um, all of our patients uh, received exome sequencing. And so therefore our data shows the diagnostic yield for exome sequencing only. We don't have any data for uh, the diagnostic yield of this non-exome sequencing indicator test. So we needed those information, those parameters in our model. And I will discuss uh, how we did that. So uh, before I go to that, uh, you can see here that our discrete event simulation now shows that um, patients that will be simulated are patients who go into the diagnostic pathway and may, may or may not have a diagnosis from that indicator test. So uh, those who would have that um, diagnosis will exit the system. That is something that is not found in our data. So how did we do that? How did we model that? Uh, to, to do that, we had to um, model the input to our model. So we have se several other sub models here. So the first is the time to an uh, indicator test. We did some testing and we found out that the time between indicator tests is dependent on the type of test that follows it. So from the data, the full data, we, um, we model that using a mixture of uh, a mixture distribution that is fitted in the data. Another thing that, uh, another stochastic element of the model is the probability of diagnosis. So uh, for that, we have from the data, the diagnostic yield for the exome sequencing. However, we don't have any, as I've mentioned, of the diagnostic yield of the non-exome sequencing test. So um, we, we looked for this first, of course, from literature, and only the CMA has published diagnostic yield. And for all the other types of non-exome sequencing um, indicator tests, we cannot find any. There are no published materials. So what we did is to, um, to pull our expert medical geneticists and ask them, to uh, make, uh, in their expert opinion, an estimate of that diagnostic yield. So um, the, we did that, and then we got their averages so that we can come up with a reasonable probability of the diagnosis from non-exome sequencing diagnostic um, indicator test. We also needed uh, to model the cost. Now, one of the strengths of our uh, study is that our testing cost does not only include just the indicator indicator tests, but all those uh, non-indicator tests. So we analyzed uh, the cost uh, from the data, and we found out that um, it is to model that, we, the best way to represent the, what we have in the data is to sample the data itself empiric empirically by uh, we used bootstrapping method. And then for the sequence, uh, we use uh, the data itself to analyze how the indicator tests are sequenced within the trajectory of the patient's diagnostic uh, pathway. Okay. So uh, going to the sequence, what we found out, and this is from the data, um, this shows uh, the sequencing of the test uh, from the first uh, indicator test up to the 14th indicator test. Um, our data at this point is just uh, for the, uh, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be 305 patients. So that's for the 305 patients. Um, we, there are some patients who have a, a, at most 14 or 14 plus uh, indicator tests uh, with West as their final indicator test. So with this sequence, if we try to model all of the sequence, if my math is correct, that will be around um, eight, about 85,000 types of sequences, which is not, uh, of course, a good use of the computer resources when we are simulating. And furthermore, upon um, consultation with our uh, genetics expert, uh, the more meaningful indicator tests will be around the 
second or third indicator test. Afterwards, if, uh, if I remember right, the term that was used is that afterwards, it's just fishing. So this, uh, after the second indicator test, uh, it's, uh, or third indicator test, more or less uh, the, the genetics expert would recommend an exome sequencing if no diagnosis is still um, found. So um, for our model, therefore, we modeled the diagnostic pathway up to the fourth indicator test, where the fourth indicator test is the exome sequencing. So the strategies that we are comparing will be, uh, there will be five diagnostic pathways or the, the five strategies that we will be comparing. We have exome sequencing as the first indicator test, second, third, and fourth. Now we also included a pathway where there is no um, exome sequencing. And um, just to remind you, we don't have any patients uh, who would uh, in, in our data that would uh, be represented by this. However, we uh, saw it fit to represent uh, this because patients uh, of a similar characteristic as our cohorts would definitely, um, would most probably have this kind of trajectory or diagnostic pathway as well. So uh, we uh, simulated that. And uh, for our probabilistic analysis, we ran our simulation for uh, 1,000 uh, replications using a large, a large number of patients. And I think we have 100,000 patients for each of the replications. So uh, here I present the results. Uh, first, uh, looking at the probability of diagno uh, diagnosis and, uh, um, as, um, and the cost per patient, we can immediately see that having uh, exome, sequencing, exome sequencing as the first test would, be, uh, would give the lowest cost. So um, it's with just one test compared to, let's say, three, two, th uh, three, and four tests, uh, exome sequencing uh, would have a cost of uh, approximately, on the average, 2,458. That includes indicator tests as well as the non-indicator tests, the, the, the routine tests that goes along with that test. So we did an incremental analysis, and we can immediately see, as, uh, as hinted by the, the, the graph, that um, exome sequencing as the first and only indicator test would dominate any other strategy. With um, yeah, so that is the result of our cost uh, of our in incremental uh, cost analysis. And for the second um, outcome that we are looking at, the time in the diagnostic pathway and time to diagnosis, this is the result. Just just a quick uh, note. Uh, uh, with regards to the difference between these two outcomes. So the time in the diagnostic pathway is the time for all patients, regardless of whether they received a diagnosis or not. While the time in the diagnose, the time in uh, to diagnose is the time uh, for uh, from uh, the time a patient receives uh, the first indicator test to the time the patient receives a diagnosis. So this is the time Time to diagnosis is uh, considers only patients who had who received a positive diagnosis, while the time in the diagnostic pathway considers all patients. So we can see here that uh, with uh, West as the second test, the time to die in the in the diagnostic pathway is um, slightly shorter than that of that uh, if you have if for patients with no exome sequencing. Of course, uh, that is not really that significant, but considering um, that it's really important for patients to receive diagnosis and especially with their, also for their family, maybe those a little uh, a time saving of that much could also make a difference. So um, that is as far as the time to diagnosis is concerned. So we can see that there is still an advantage to having um, exome sequencing as a second test compared to having three sequential non-exome sequencing tests. Um, so uh, Deborah is going to uh, talk about the, um, the results of other studies. 
Yeah, so it's always uh, amazing to me looking at a summary slide that's really simplified <laughs> and all of the work that uh, went in to produce that. Um, but you might say, well, so what? Okay, you know, that's interesting, <laughs> which we think it is, um, and actually is very relevant in terms of um, um, decision making and, and policy um, decisions and also uh, timely, but there have, of course, for those of you who are familiar at all with this literature, there have been other studies similar to this that have been done. Um, and we'll just highlight um, well, a reasonable handful of them. I don't know if it's completely exhaustive, but it's, a, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, there have been studies, uh, for example, this one uh, by Howell and colleagues, um, done all the way back in 2018, so five years ago, um, that looked at, you know, cost effectiveness of early genetic testing. Um, so yes, you know, they also suggested that early and targeted exome sequencing has lowered costs. Um, and they're suggesting that introducing whole exome sequencing uh, any at any point in the pathway increases the probability of diagnosis. So this is consistent. Um, what we have found. The trick with this is it's a very specialized cohort. Um, it was 114 infants specifically, um, so very specific time period in the developmental cycle, and specifically with severe epilepsy. So yeah, the results might be generalizable, but of course one doesn't know until one looks at a larger group. So there were certainly indications that, you know, it would make sense um, that we would find similar results. Next one is then Stark and Pan. Um, so uh, we um, there have been a couple studies from this team. Um, they were one of the earliest people to come out um, with looking at this prospective comparison. Um, this is the uh, an Australian team of investigators. Um, so they uh, we were we actually used this. Um, in our defense, when we were presenting this grant, there was a previous study by Tan, who is the senior uh, person in this team. And um, they had done some really early uh, modeling. Um, the challenge with this is that um, it was focused on, again, a small sample, 40 infants, specifically infants. It was specifically limited to singleton exon sequencing. And I don't think I mentioned it, but ours, maybe Tony did, but ours included not only singleton, but duo and trio. So we had all of them and quads. Tony's whispering to me. Um, yes. So yeah, so we included this broad array, which quite frankly is more typical. Um, um, it's quite specialized if you were doing singleton exome sequencing. And it was specifically in a tertiary level children's hospital. So the sample uh, is quite specific. Having said that, um, it's also consistent in terms of its general findings. You know, yes, using whole exome sequencing decreases uh, or increases the probability of diagnosis and also decreases um, the cost when you do it um, early um, in the testing sequence. So consistent, um, but very specific. Next one, I think, is uh, Nick. So this is a team of colleagues from uh, BC. So this was led. This paper was led by Nick Dragovlovic, whom you may know. Um, and uh, they looked specifically um, at suspected genetic dis disorders. So this is a broader spectrum of of the sample population. Um, and it was specifically done in the context of a model of service delivery, not, not with the view of the whole diagnostic trajectory. So this is actually the, it's called the CAUSES study, and that stands for the Clinical Assessment and Utility of Sequencing and Evaluation of a Service. Um, so this is the CAUSES study. Um, and as with the other studies that were previously done, um, this was focused specifically, and I didn't mention this for the other ones, but this comment applies virtually on all of these studies. They focus specifically on the costs associated with the genetic and genomic consultation. So what we're talking about is the consult visit, the initial visits, the sample acquisition, the interpretation of the genetic testing, et cetera. 
but not the diagnostic journey from the patient and the family's perspective. So you have to read these things kind of carefully because they all sound the same <laughs> in their title, quite frankly. But then when you read the details, you realize that they're actually measuring something different. Um, I guess the good news, or however you want to interpret it, is that the results are still consistent um, and they, they are giving us similar uh, um, findings. And then I think the last one is the Abbott study. Oh, there's Wu. Okay. So this is also um, a little more recent now. We're moving into 2022. And this was an Australian group as well with some of my colleagues. Um, and they also looked at um, cost effectiveness analysis. They used a decision tree um, and also used a discrete event simulation. They used uh, multiple methods. Um, but they specifically focus on this cohort, which is mitochondrial disorders again. So again, very um, specific. And this was also specifically monogenetic kidney disease with 78 pediatric patients onset. Did they find the same results? Yes, it looks like uh, we just copied and pasted the same results. But yes, it's a consistent sort of general finding but again, appreciating the differences. And then I think the last one is Michael Abbott's study. So this is colleagues of mine um, from uh, Aberdeen. Uh, and uh, I was actually on the advisory committee for this study. Um, and this is broader again. Um, so that's good. Diagnosis of a rare developmental disorder Can't come with the same kind of conclusions. Um, and this is also um, helping to inform the Scottish um, decision-making authorities about whether sh they should do uh, genome-wide sequencing um, in patients. I should note this one also includes genome-wide sequencing as opposed to genome-exome sequencing. Um, but again, one of the challenges for them in, is their costs are specifically in the genetics clinic um, all focused around the consult and then testing. Um, and then the next, I think, I think that was sort of our, our sort of just a, a flash of the literature. And now really as conclusions, I think we can say pretty confidently that exome sequencing is the first test, um, is expected to de decrease the cost, the time to diagnosis and the time in the diagnostic pathway. And based, the next slide, based on what we found, um, we did see in these data, which are pretty extensive, uh, it's the largest cohort of all of those we've seen by multiple times. Um, and it's also a broad heterogeneous group from eight different centers um, and therefore many different medical geneticists. Um, so introducing exome sequencing early in the diagnostic pathway increases the probability of a diagnosis considerably. I mean, you saw the numbers from Tony, it's like 20%. It's not trivial. Um, and if it's done first or early on, um, it can decrease the cost. And so all of this, the statements on this slide are compared to no exome sequencing. And of course, Tony so showed you it in terms of multiple potential tiers and pathways. So um, this is uh, fantastic news. Um, now we need to move exome sequencing really into clinical practice and, um, and also um, you know, support these results uh, in that way. Um, this is part of the work that um, we're doing both in Alberta through our GAP grants, which the genome applied um, programs um, that genome, uh, genome province, whether it's Genome Alberta or Genome Ontario, have implemented. And similarly, with my colleagues in Ontario, um, they're uh, implementing and looking at putting um, exome sequencing earlier in the diagnostic pathway. And I think you have a couple more slides, Tony. Um, well, what are our next steps? Um, we have noted um, a few times here, we have this large cohort. Uh, no, you can go back, sorry. Um, and this is what our study strengths and limitations are, but we have this large group. There's a wide variety of rare diseases. We've got all the way back to birth. Um, not just the time of testing. So that's a huge differentiator from other literature. Um, we have multi-centers, two provinces, multi-provinces, and we've included 
all the indicator and all the non-indicator tests or a large number of tests over a large period of time. Um, a, a big weakness of our study is that we didn't have the non-exome sequencing comparator group. And Tony described for you um, how we manage that um, in terms of working with our medical geneticists um, to create the comparator and doing scenario and sensitivity analysis. Um, we do feel really confident based on that, though, um, that this is a robust uh, conclusion from our results. Sorry, Tony. Next steps are um, we have the whole cohort of 751, which we're analyzing. Our data are already linked now in Alberta and Ontario. So working with Alberta Health Services, we've got the linkage. And in Ontario with the ICES, the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Scientists, to the administrative health data. And so we will have all of the healthcare resource use and costs in the diagnostic pathway. And um, the next step in our modeling is not only to look at the diagnosis and the increased diagnosis uh, and costs, but the change in clinical management. Because what I didn't mention in this study is we have a whole sub-study uh, where we've looked at the clinical utility of these tests uh, in changing how patients were managed. So that is going to be the next step um, in this whole process. And with that, I hope we have some questions and many, many thanks uh, to our, to our co-investigators, colleagues, um, and of course our funders from uh, Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, Genome Alberta, CIHR. Um, this was a, a large grant and um, and of course, many, many thanks to our research team members, as well as, of course, our patients and uh, in providing us uh, the privilege of looking at these data to try to make a case for this. I would also just close with a comment that we're really excited. Um, Brian had mentioned um, with the One Child, Every Child Canada First Research Excellence Fund Award, we have been able to establish in Alberta um, the Canadian Rare Disease Network which is a network of networks. You may have heard of CORD, um, Durhane Juan Rieger, if you're into rare diseases, I'm sure you've heard her name. She's been a staunch advocate for, oh gosh, decades for rare diseases. And moving forward, we're working closely with her um, as the um, Canadian Rare Disease Network to advance um, the work in rare diseases in Canada. And as you know, there was a huge announcement uh, through the Canadian government for supporting uh, access to drugs for treatments, et cetera, in rare disease. So it's a very exciting time to be working in this space um, anywhere, I guess, but especially in Canada, there's some really exciting uh, momentum. And uh, let us know if you're interested in working in this space because there's a lot of uh, opportunities. So. Yeah, so I think that's all. I don't know, Brian um, yeah. and uh, Nicole, if you had any questions from the group. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that presentation. Very interesting. And um, it was very, very interesting to hear how you dealt with the, the non-comparator group, because um, it definitely sometimes is a challenge to um, collect that information. But um, I guess I'll start things off while um, while people put in their questions in the, the chat. But um, you mentioned that you'll uh, be looking into the uh, administrative data to collect um, the cost on healthcare resource utilization and whatnot. Would you have an opportunity um, doing this exercise to possibly look at a uh, comparator group um, that way, maybe looking at a, a population cohort that will be matched um, for various factors. Um, do, do you think that you'll have that opportunity or or is it specific only to the cohort in which you've um, collected information so far? Do you want me to do it? Take that? Or? I can yeah, unfortunately, because we have identified our cohorts, and as I've mentioned, our cohorts already received WES uh, exome sequencing. Uh, I, it's not possible to pull uh, from the administrative data that information that would uh, those patients would have <laughs> do not belong to our cohort. So, yeah, 
Yeah, that's the short and sad answer, I guess. But um, but the more optimistic answer is, well, maybe even a less less positive answer is that um, one of the really interesting, unfortunate things is that rare disease is not well characterized in administrative data. Um, so, Brian, if it's a really good question and it's, it did cross our minds, but it really wasn't a, a, a way forward because you would have to then look at people who were diagnosed and to be able to match it, it would have been it would be very tricky um, because many of those people don't get coded in the administrative data. So unless it's a really hmm, um, common rare disease, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but a common rare disease. Um, that does get coded, for which there is an ICD-9-10 code, um, it would be hard to pull the equivalent. Um, so you'd have an odd group, I think. And then the other thing is we would need um, to be able to um, extract them, and we wouldn't have the full, complete medical chart records that we have to compare to our group. Because if you remember, one of the things I was trying to highlight in the early slides is we went into the chart, and that includes the medical genetics chart. So we have way more extensive details about all the testing that was ordered through the genetics clinic that doesn't always make it into the admin data. Because as I mentioned, some of these tests are done out of province. So it's only recorded in the clinical chart. So it's it's a li little more convoluted than that, although I appreciate the comment. The other thing that I'll throw in here, and I'm delighted to say that we're working with some of the people, um, we were showing their results, but the people, for instance, at the CAUSES study in BC, um, plus a team in Ontario, including our current team, but also including other cohorts, cohorts with Stephen Shear and um, Danielle Barbeau, for example, on the PON data. Um, we just won a CHR grant, um, which was specifically targeted to this issue, Brian, because coding is not well done in the admin data um, for these rare diseases, which, and the whole focus of this grant is about whether and how we can make a case for implementing the ICD-11 coding, um, which allows for more detail and better coding in depth for the IC for rare diseases. So they've implemented this in France and um, Europe, and France explicitly in some countries in Europe. Um, and we're looking to try to make the case uh, for this in Canada using multiple cohorts from BC, uh, Ontario, and uh, Alberta, and looking at the chart compared to the actual cohort. So we're doing what you've said, but in the context of this grant to see where the mismatch is and what gets missed in the in the admin data. So that study is starting now. Um, literally, um, just email them about that to my colleague this morning in Ontario. So yeah, great question. Oh, that's excellent. Um, I see the 11. That's uh, amazing. Okay, so I have a, a, com a comment and question here from Wade. Um, I'll read it out. It says, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. Marshall and Dr. Tagima Cruz. Uh, very interesting work. And if I were a policymaker, this would be strong evidence to support policy for uh, exome sequencing in this population. This research is outside of my area of expertise, but I'm curious if there were, are any safety concerns associated with the test and do the analysis take that into account at all? And then it's apologies if you had already talked about this uh, in your presentation. Do you want to say what? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. And uh, uh, for sure that is something um, we all think about, but however, uh, for this specific part of our study, this modeling, we um, we we dealt with data, and um, the bigger part of the study, I think Deborah can talk more about that. But for this modeling part, uh, we have no, um, we have not considered safety or anything because it's 
as I mentioned, it's just not included in our data. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And thank you, Wade, for raising it. No, you didn't miss it. Um, um, but there's a few ways to answer this. Um, undoubtedly, um, the whole diagnostic odyssey and testing is is um, has impacts on patients and families, and and you know what's done as a consequence. Um, one of the things we didn't include in this presentation, but was to part of the larger program that Tony was alluding to, is um, a preferences study that we did as part of the first part of Care for Rare before it was solved. Um, and that is looking at, you know, what matters to patients and how do they balance and weigh the idea of getting a diagnosis, getting a diagnosis early, whether it's done by whole exome sequencing or other kind of tests. Um, what about the positive and the negative labeling that can happen with diagnosis, et cetera, and also the opportunities that are opened, quite frankly, when you get a diagnosis. And one of the things that came out of this is, yeah, there's potential harms that can be done when a child is, is diagnosed. Um, you know, there are negative sort of consequences from a family and psychosocial kind of perspective, as well as um, sometimes in a school environment or a social environment. Um, but in the end, the positive things about getting a diagnosis outweigh um, the potential negative concerns. So that isn't explicit to like medical safety concerns, but this was in a broader sort of psychosocial um, context for families. And I can say from those results, families are extremely keen and it's very important to them to get a diagnosis, even if there's nothing they can do to get it treated. Because if they get a diagnosis, they have access to social supports, educational supports, et cetera. And if they don't, they they can't access those services. So um, it's not, as they say, exactly medical safety, but there's a whole dynamic around the, the diagnosis process and the act of getting it and the consequences related to it. Yeah, and I, I wonder as you're talking about that, whether there is um, a probability or a chance of a misdiagnosis um, yeah. in that the exome sequencing uh, might show a condition that a person actually truly does not and maybe there may be harms associated with that as well. I, I don't know the I don't know the test well enough to know whether that actually it, it can happen, but um, I, I could be a potential harm maybe. Yeah, I think in the case, so yes, every test always has some risk. I think in the case with sequencing and exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, it's pretty small um, because these are genetic tests. So if it's a known, I guess the difference is if it's a known genetic variant, it's probably very high um, probability that it is indeed that, that condition or that rare disease. Um, but, you know, samples are sometimes not managed properly and it could be inaccurate. The, I think the bigger risk is that they find what's called um, variants of unknown significance or VUS, um, and they don't know what to do. So sometimes the psychosocial effect of not knowing, like knowing there's something not right about the genome, but it's unknown, and there's nothing you can actually action. So there's a whole literature around this that can be have a negative utility essentially on the family or the patient. Um, so there is that consideration as well, which is partly why you know there are these um, we we we've done them, but many of my colleagues have also looked at preferences studies to say you know what's the consequence of of getting. Um, return failure or uh, returned results from genomic testing that don't have um, an answer, basically. So, yeah, excellent. So we have a few more minutes um, for any last questions that people may have. 
Uh, oh, another comment by Wade here is, says, very interesting. I can imagine the access to support would be crucial despite some of the negative consequences of the diagnosis. And uh, a thank you there. OK, excellent. So um, I guess an, another question I have. Um, so the, the, the costs that were collected, uh, if I understood correctly, was uh, direct costs. So you didn't include the costs to the individuals or families um, um, having to take the test and um, having to take multiple tests as well. Or, or was that included in the, the, the model that you created? No. Um, in terms of multiple tests, uh, for sure, because uh, all of the indicator tests, all the tests for that particular patient was included. Uh, the cost of the family, which is, I, I, I believe, would be significant. Unfortunately, we don't have that data. Um, that's not included in our data. Correct. So Tony's correct in this study. Um, I'm glad to say that we will be doing that, but it's a separate study because that wasn't how this um, grant was structured. Um, we did uh, think and hope to collect that, um, but as you can imagine, this is a lot uh, fair burden to collect this in this cohort, and we weren't able to do that within the scope of the grant. Um, but we are applying, and we also have a precision health grant it was the other LSARP that we won at the time and, and we at the same competition um, for which we, I lead the health economics. Um, we have a childhood arthritis cohort. We've done exactly that, Brian. We have a whole other um, presentation we could do on family burdens associated with child arthritis. And this includes the costs for the family, um, both in terms of braces, in terms of doctor's appointments, travel, um, you know, anything that doesn't get covered, changes in workplace, the work productivity, all of this. Um, and we're doing some of that in uh, the radar grant that I just talked about, as well as our extension to our childhood arthritis, which will go into the rare diseases. So, yes, we want to capture that as well. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, so are there any last minute questions from uh the people out there have many more questions, but um, I, unfortunately, we are pretty much out of time. We're at the top of the hour. So um, I'd like to th thank both uh, Dr. Marshall um, as well as uh, Tony for your presentations today and seeing if there are any other closing remarks I need to make here. Um, I thank also everyone online for attending and uh, so this is the first of a series of monthly uh, rounds that uh, we'll have for the upcoming year and uh, information for the uh, next round which uh, is scheduled for November will be posted uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, we will also post it on the website noaa.ca with details if um, you would like to uh, get that information that way. Also a reminder to visit uh, the website and to subscribe to our mailing list if you haven't already done so to stay up to date with all NOAA related activities. So again, I'd like to thank uh, both the presenters today for such an interesting and engaging presentation. And I'd like to wish everyone a good day. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Going.